There's no way on Veterans Day that we don't focus on Veterans Day. You're going to like this show. Welcome in to Dan York's State of Mind. I am he, and I appreciate uh, you tuning in tonight. Now, listen, I am not here on, uh, you know, we, we, we do the show every day for that day. We recorded this show last week for Veterans Day. Um, I would hope, though, that many of you will take the time, did take the time. If you didn't make a note that next year you're going to take the time. You cannot let Veterans Day go by without some recognition of some kind, whether it be a quiet moment, you know, a prayer, uh, seeing a veteran and saying thank you, or what you ought to be doing, which is to attend a, a Veterans Day celebration uh, or commemoration or solemn ceremony of some kind. Uh, far be it for me to pe preach to you, but uh, Veterans Day goes by way too unnoticed, seems to me. Um, I've got some terrific guests. Do you know that Rhode Island College is one of the most recognized military-oriented um, facilities in the country? And you're going to learn about that later on our broadcast. But right now, I want to show you a little photo here. This is a picture of a, of a it's a, like a mini book written by Major Joseph Gosselin, who hails from just over the border in Massachusetts, life after Pearl Harbor. Thank you, sir, for your service to the country. And thanks for coming to the broadcast. All right. You are, you know, I, I just want to, just in case you're guessing at home, 92 years old. Three. Ni uh, I said 92 before the show, and you went, yeah, well, you don't know that your wife is 92. Anyway, yeah. three. Um, and you drive. You drove okay. over here. You're in great shape. I try to be. <laughs> and you're the only remaining, you think, you're the only remaining living member of a group of soldiers in World War II who were prisoners of war. <laughs> for about a year and a half period of time, right? A year and a half, yeah. All right. So, uh, again, thanks so much for your service. I mean, I, I could do 10 shows with you, but I, I want to I wanna spend some time talking about your story. Now, this little pamphlet that you just saw, uh, you wrote this, what, seven, eight years ago? Yeah, 1987. And you wrote it for what purpose? Because I was still remembering what, what happened. <laughs> and then, it was the advent of the computers, too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, so you know, I could put it. Major Gosselin has gotten very computer friendly. You see our little, his little laptop uh, doohickey here. He's been going through all sorts of photos, and Jess actually copied some. See, see on the big screen, that's all your stuff. That's all. Isn't that magic? Yeah. You brought it in here, and it ends up there. But you've uh, got a whole chronicle. Is that a website that we should point people to? Oh, uh, this is just his private stuff. But you've got a lot yeah. of com commemoration. Uh, on here that we really can't show the people because it's on the screen. But I really want to talk about your story. I don't right. need I don't need a lot of visuals. Um, you left to go to to war only a couple of years after you graduated from Durfee High School. Uh, way nineteen forty. Well, right after Pearl Harbor. Uh, Pearl Harbor was in December, and I uh, I went I, and when they say, well, come back after the uh, New Year's. So on uh, January second. I went up to Boston and uh, I enlisted, and uh, I was, originally I was classified as an aircraft mechanic. Mm -hmm. But uh, due to the mi on kind of the mix-up, I wound up uh, uh, to a, a field at Hunter Field. We were supposed to connect with an outfit at Hunter Field, and the, uh, the outfit had gone overseas already. So we were orphans on the base, even though after being in for a year and we're still a private. We were aircraft mechanics. We graduated from Ingalls School of Aeronautics on the West Coast, went to Douglas Aircraft on the A-24s, uh, dive bombers. And when we came back to Hunter Field, we weren't connected to anybody. Wow. So we were kind of free agents. So we said, can we go over to the cadet office and, and enlist at that? So we went over and took the exam and see where it's accepted as a, uh, a cadet training. So when I was classified as a bombardier, so they sent me to uh, uh, spring uh, to Texas, and I graduated on the uh, 5th of October. Uh, on the 4th of October, I had to be discharged from the Army, and on the 5th, I was made a second lieutenant. I was a commissioned officer. How did that happen? <laughs> discharged and then made a second lieutenant. Yeah, but well, I couldn't be a second lieutenant as uh, with a, a, a corporal rating. I see. Yeah, so they had a I had to be discharged, so I got an honorable discharge, and then the next day they commissioned me as a second lieutenant. You are a, 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 a Purple Heart recipient. 
Uh, originally, <laughs> after the war. After the war. It wasn't, uh, right. wasn't during the war that they In fact, you, you were telling me part of the show, it took a while, huh? Oh, yeah. It took a long time. Yeah. How many years? Uh, about uh, 69 years. 69 years yeah. to get your Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. But you got it. Yeah. Your prisoner of war experience mm -hmm. makes you a unique hero in America's history. Well, uh, I, I was... Uh, uh, interrogated down in Frankfurt, Germany, and then I was shipped to a, a POW camp. Stalag Luft III is, is prominent for The Great Escape. Hmm. They made a movie of it. Right. I got there the same week that The Escape took place. Is that right? Yeah, March uh, 1930s, uh, 1944. Yeah. How, how, did, how did it end up that you were that you were nabbed? How did you end up in the prison? When I, well, uh, on a, we were on a second daylight Berlin raid, and uh, we were on the left side of the formation, and uh, we encountered a, a flock of uh, ME-109s, German fighters, and they circled up from 1 o'clock high, went around the formation, then when they got to 11 o'clock, they peeled off and right, came right down on us. And uh, the next thing I know, my pilot said, get your ass out of here, we're going down. And <laughs> then we had to get out at 20,000 feet, so we bailed out. Oh, my God. And, uh, that's when I, I uh, injured my back when I hit there, but I n they don't, never classified it as a purple heart <laughs> at the time. You could, really? Yeah. That's, uh, and uh, I was sent down to, uh, for interrogation down at the, near Frank Frankfurt, uh, Germany. Did you give anything up? And that was the reason. You're supposed to give your name, rank, and serial number, but I refused to go beyond that. So for some reason, he put me aside, and uh, I was in uh, solitary confinement for three weeks. And I said, I never saw the rest of the crew. I said, how come? I was the only one of my crew that went. And after interrogation for uh, the last time, he came in, he says, well, the one time I came in there and my tail gunner was sent, standing there, he said, you know this airman. I said, what was I going to say for granted? Right. <laughs> I said, of course. I right. said, he's my tail gunner. He said, yeah, he said, you ought to know me, he's your tail gunner, you know? Right. And, uh, but then uh, he asked me some questions. I refused to run this engine more, so he said, you can go back and rot for all I care. That was a major catch with the interrogation officer. So after about a week, I got sick and tired of <laughs> laying there in solitary confinement. I had to see the major. So he asked me, he says, well, uh, when I saw him, he says, I guess we can let you go because we know enough about you. So he gave me with the base I was at, the formation I was at, and the so commander. They, up. they did the intelligence on you while you were yeah. in solitary confinement. Yeah. Oh, and uh, wow. he says, you know, Lieutenant Irwin. I don't remember. He said, you ought to know him. He lived. In, he used to bunk with you in Big Spring, Texas. <laughs> How they get all this information? Oh, no. Somebody's not getting them. Just no. name, rank, and serial number. You weren't laughing at the time, though. I bet. No. 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 <laughs> it's 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 as you reminisce. It's <clears throat> funny now. It wasn't funny yeah. then. So you were 18 months yeah. as a prisoner of war. Had, uh, when, what caused you finally to be able to be released? Uh, well, uh, it's a long, kind of long story, but I tried to shorten it up. Yeah. Uh, on uh, January 29th, uh, Russians was up, and this uh, prison camp was on the border of Poland, right on the eastern front, on the east uh, and uh, the southeast of Berlin. And the Russians were about 20 kilometers from our base. So uh, they got the order to evacuate, so they had to evacuate us. So it was the coldest winter, winter on record, and it's January 29th, snowing like hell. And uh, then uh, he says, well, the commanding officer Goodrich came and told us, we go back and get yourself ready, we're moving out. So I put our belongings together, and we went out by the gate, and we waited there until 11 o'clock at night, and we took off. There is no stop. <laughs> and we watched for two days. 64 miles. Unbelievable. In the snow. And Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, I, I, could you not listen to Major Gosselin all day long about, about his experience? You know, the greatest generation, no kidding. What's it feel like to be, I mean, you're, you're pretty good health. You're driving, you're 93, well, there was one and thing all, the, all your, the guys that you're with are all gone. What, what, how does yeah. that, how do you deal know. with that? I was born on Friday the 13th. You were born on Friday the 13th? Yeah. That's not such an unlucky day then, is it? I guess not. Yeah. No. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Um, Veterans Day blows by all too quickly for too many people, don't right. you think? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thought on, on your sacrifice, your heroism, that of your fellow soldiers, prisoners of war, all of the other soldiers since 
Does no, no, really, give it a thought, because that's, uh, I guess, uh, uh, it's keep me from going berserk, I guess. <laughs> just uh, ignoring the whole thing, you know, and just, uh, well, just remember. As a matter of fact, I rem that's an area, uh, uh, something that I remember all the time, that sticks with me all the time. And I, What's that? Yeah, the whole uh, incident of oh. me. Uh, well, you recall it. You recall it like it happened yesterday. Yeah, well, that's uh, what it is. And it's been an indelible part of your life, right. even when you came back and you married and you had two kids and you've got grandkids, that kind of thing has yeah. never left you. Yeah. Well, I don't know why you would think it would. Um, fantastic story. But uh, uh, from there, from that march that we, we, we led us at Springburg and they put us in cattle uh, 48 boxcars, which was uh, uh, in French, it's a cadence de me richereau, like 40 men and eight horses. That's what the French used to carry on their, on their uh, mm -hmm. boxcars. On it. And so they had 80 of us in each boxcar. And it, we traveled down at two. Uh, the, well, it's, we spent three days on there, traveling down to uh, near, back near Mooseburg. And at Mooseburg, I was still like seven, eight. All right, well, here's what we're going to do. And uh, uh, you got to come back next year, and we'll do a much longer show. On, I'm serious, on, on the life of time, because you ain't going anywhere. I mean, hell, you're in better shape than I am, that's for sure. Um, best to you, your family, your wife, who I know is, is struggling a little bit. Yeah. But uh, um, on behalf of the audience, I can promise you that we say thank you for your service to the country. Yeah. And thanks for being a uh, participant on our Veterans Day yeah. program. Major Joseph Gosselin, when we come back, we'll talk to you about some of the stuff that goes on at Rhode Island College and some, some more reflections on Veterans Day. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. I was real. I think you'd agree that you could talk to Major Goslin forever, um, and he's he's still with us, and he's still telling Jess a lot of the stories. And you know what? It's a it's a beautiful thing. Uh, uh, happy Veterans Day, and you know, for some it's not so happy, but it, it ought to be a, a day that we pay attention to and commemorate. So we'll continue with that theme. I did not realize that Rhode Island College has such a, a prominent reputation for its respect for the military and all the programs that are going on there. Uh, Dr. Monica Darcy is here from Rhode Island College. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And uh, Gunnery Sergeant Neil Yateman is here as well, both from, from Rhode Island College. But I'm going to jump over here to the gunnery sergeant for a second because you too have served the country sir thank you very much for your service um your experience in the military is pretty extensive as well yes tell us uh, about it. 22 years um well you know uh i was an enlisted marine uh, so i understand when the major said he was discharged on one day he was discharged from an enlisted contract right. and then became uh an officer um 
I was an air traffic controller uh, my first six years in the Marine Corps. Uh, traveled overseas, you know, to Asia, uh, Korea, Japan. Uh, enjoyed it immensely. Um, and then uh, um, air traffic control, you know, I just wanted to do something a little bit more. And so I uh, disappointed my mother, who was a Navy nurse, and transferred into Marine Infantry. And uh, from there, uh, I was stationed uh, primarily at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And but um, I was part of Third Battalion, and Third Battalion is what's called a Victor unit. Mm -hmm. um, whether I was with Fourth Marines, Sixth Marines, or Eighth Marines, uh, we could be anywhere in the world in 24 hours or less. And so. Central America, South America, but primarily um, we spent a lot of time in Africa. Um, it's not a place we hear about a lot. Well, you know, uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, they were um, uh, slightly after Somalia. Uh, we did a lot of evacuations. As my father, uh, um, a Naval Academy graduate, said to me, he goes, hey, gee whiz, you guys made page seven of the Washington Post today. You know, people weren't really paying attention to what we were doing. Yeah. Korean War. Korean War veterans are funky about talking about the yeah, Korean War. My father was a Korean War uh, veteran. Yeah. It, you know, it's so funny because I think we actually have a CG, uh, you know, something underneath you that said Korean War veteran, and it, it, it couldn't be. No. Because you look too young to me. And so somehow. I, I wasn't it, even born yet. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, on that, because we're talking about World War II and then the Korean War and then the progressive wars from since, um, do you remember what your father had to say ab about the Korean War? Because I've known a lot of Korean War veterans who are, who are pretty standoffish about what it is they experienced. It's a, a unique group. Right. Um, my father never talked about it. And it wasn't until um, my father was in uh, the Navy's first A-4 jet squadron. And in that squadron, uh, two of the gentlemen in that squadron ended up becoming um, chief of naval operations. So, I mean, it was a pretty elite group of uh, men in that, in that squadron. Mm -hmm. And never. We never talked about it. Um, my father did a lot of uh, talking to himself. And when he was probed by one of us, I have six brothers, when he was probed by one of us, he would say, not now. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, 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 again, a conversation that we should expand upon because uh, that is common uh, with the Korean War veterans. So your experience, your dad's experience. Dr. Darcy, you are, uh, you're working at Rhode Island College with current veterans, veterans of all shapes, sizes, ages, and I didn't realize how, how invested Rick is really in this entire endeavor. It's a big, it's a big mark you've put on this. It is. Um, the school has put uh, a fair amount of commitment behind the fact that we, you know, we recognize we're a military-friendly school. We appreciate that. We appreciate the veterans that we have on campus. Our enrollment has increased. Military over friendly is a term that rolls off your tongue, but it, it's really something that's actually computed and researched. And military friendly <laughs> means what? It's a coined term um, by a media group, uh, a magazine called GI Jobs, and it's a yearly survey they run. What they're looking for are the efforts that schools are making to truly embrace veterans, that we don't just perhaps attract veterans to our campus for their tuition dollars. We have them on our campus with their tuition dollars, and we provide services that make them um, capable of being successful in their education careers. So once attracted to our schools, how do we help retain them? Hmm. And our services are, are pretty broad-based. Neil works uh, in our Veterans Resource Center. We have two other VA work-study students who work there with us. Um, we have a web of services across the campus that are um, integrated to be supportive to our vets. Right, we'll talk more about what's going on at RIC and uh, what the mission is there on this Veterans Day Eve. Stay with us.